Good morning. Well, it's a good morning for me. I don't know if it's morning time for you. But hello and welcome to this video. I was not planning on doing this video because I was going to do something this year where I was just going to come out with videos like every three months and just do like a wrap up of every three months. <laughs> but then I had to go ahead and read 20 books in just one month. <laughs> this is the most I've ever read in a month, books wise and page number wise, so I, I got a lot of reading done and I knew that my reading was going to continue in the same way, so I don't think I was going to be able to do a three month wrap up or else it would have been like an hour and a half long. So we're doing this now. I will still do like movies and TV shows and stuff like that every three months and I'm doing that just because I had a really great time taking a break from YouTube last year because doing these YouTube videos kind of started feeling like a chore in a sense instead of really fun so that's another reason why I took that break and so now that I do want to come back but I want to like you know have fun with it so maybe not doing videos every month, but now it looks like I might have to do them every month if this is the reading I'm going to be doing. So don't expect a wrap up every single month. I will only do this as an exception if I end up reading like 20 books. I hope you don't mind how casual this video is. Like I'm in a t-shirt, I'm in my sweatpants, no makeup. I literally just woke up like five minutes ago. So this is a time. But let's talk about some stats for my books. Oh wow, <laughs> these first three stats, the numbers are literally exactly the same. Okay, so for format, I read seven hardcover books and 13 paperbacks. I read 13 white authors and seven BIPOC authors. I read seven books that came out in 2021. I read a lot of new releases. Um, and then 13 backlist. I read 10 male authors and 10 female authors. I read one middle grade, seven young adult, and 12 adult. So the shortest book that I read was 111 pages. The longest book I read was 450 pages. Uh, so total, I read 5,396 pages, which averages to 174 pages a day, which to me is just ridiculous. <laughs> um, okay, so I read six sci-fi, three nonfiction, two poetry, six contemporary, one romance, one fantasy, and one humor. And then for stars, I read two two-star books, seven three-stars, six four-stars, and four five-stars, which comes to an average of 3.6 stars. Yeah, so let's just get talking about these books. I literally do not know where to start. So I'm starting with this. I read an entire graphic novel series in the month of January. They hold up the first one. So this is Why the Last Man. Um, it's by Brian K. Vaughn, Pia Guerra, and Jose Marzan Jr. I really enjoy Brian K. Vaughn. I've read his saga series and really enjoyed it. And actually, a friend of mine gifted this to me as the Secret Santa gift. And she didn't even know my love for Brian K. Vaughn. She just also loves Brian K. Vaughn. And was, I was excited that she gave me this one so I can check out more Brian K. Vaughn. And of course, as soon as I read this, I loved it and I had to get all the other ones. <laughs> I'm normally not like a graphic novel person, but lately I've been getting into graphic novels. Why the Last Man, I think was not his first graphic novel series? Was it his first? I don't know, but it's from, I think, the early 2000s, and it's about this guy named Yorick. He is the last man on earth. Something happens, like a disease or whatnot happens, and literally at the same time, every single guy dies. <laughs> Anything with a Y chromosome dies, so even all the male animals died. The only males left are Yorick and his pet monkey, Ampersand. And so now it's just a, a world full of ladies, and he's trying to stay undercover and discreet while him and his bodyguard meet up with a doctor who's known for cloning. I don't know why I did quotations with cloning. She, she is a doctor that's known for like trying to figure out cloning. And so they meet up with her, find her 
and just kind of go through this whole journey of figuring out why he's the last man on earth, um, trying to like find his girlfriend who's all the way in Australia while he's in America. There's just a lot of like side stories going on, but mainly it's just we gotta protect the last man on earth and figure out why he is that so that way we can replicate it and bring men back into the world. That way life can continue. I thought this whole series was fantastic. I, I, it's weird because I know like Brian K. Vaughan is a man, but he does write women so well. This was a super fun read. I don't actually have a lot to say either. I've realized I didn't write notes for these books, so I should probably hold it here since this is where most of the dead space is. Okay, we're gonna do that from now on. I didn't write a whole lot of notes for these books, so you're just going off of what I can remember, and I don't have a lot to say about it. I mean, the artwork I really enjoy. It's good artwork. It's a great storyline, a great premise, and I think Brian K. Vaughn does a fantastic job with it. There's so many surprises, things I don't see coming, and it's just, it's very exciting. And yeah, I highly recommend this graphic novel series. Okay, so for book one, I gave it five stars. Book two, I gave four stars. Book three, I also gave four stars. Book four, I gave three stars. I felt like book four did too many, like, back in time things to explain stuff that happened, but like the back in time stuff didn't really, mm, not so much make sense at the time, but it all came together by the fifth book. So this one was just like a confusing ride, but the fifth book I gave five stars. The one middle grade that I read was Edge of Great, the Julie and the Phantoms book, which was not great. <laughs> I don't, it's not even on the edge of great. There were two reasons I wanted this book. Well, three reasons. Number one, it's Julie and the Phantoms, so like I have to. It's my, my, one of my absolute favorite TV shows, and I haven't met a single person who has watched it and not liked it. Just saying. If you haven't watched Julie and the Phantoms, you will not be disappointed, I promise you that. But um, yeah, so I was like, Julie and the Phantoms, I have to have it no matter what. But also, it was uh, going to be multiple point of views, so I was like, ooh, we might get some like different information because, you know, we're not just Julie's head, we're also Luke's head, we're in, uh, who is it, Alex's, and so, oh, and Reggie's. Like, we're all getting their points of view, so like maybe we'll get a few little like new things, and they also did market it as um, having new information that wasn't in the show. That is false advertising. There's no new information. So it's very short. So there's a lot of actually very important scenes, especially towards the end, that have been cut out of the book. Also, I realize it's hard to really translate like the songs and the feelings of serotonin that you get from the show and put it into book form. It is also exactly the same dialogue, just written out and put in here, which I, I honestly did expect that. But it was just, but I didn't realize how annoying it would be <laughs> to just literally have like the same exact words, but like you don't get the actor saying them and you don't get like the atmosphere of like where they're at. And so it's just, it, it didn't feel as good reading it as it does watching it. But I gave this two stars and I think it's a, a very generous two stars. Um, and I think I did that just because of how much I love the show, which means I absolutely love these characters so much. All right, next we'll do, I guess, nonfiction. So for nonfiction, I technically have like four books, but one of them I considered it more humor than nonfiction, but it's still technically nonfiction. But anyway, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is this, is Keep Going uh, by Austin Kleon. 10 Ways to Stay Creative in Good Times and Bad. I actually really enjoyed this. Uh, there are a lot of really great tips, a lot of really great info in here. Um, I definitely found it more helpful than I thought I was going to. It was one of those books where I was like, I don't know if this is actually going to do anything for me, but I actually did really enjoy it, and it's definitely one I want to go back to whenever I am feeling not creative and down. 
kind of like I am now. Whenever I am just like not feeling productive, I guess, or just not feeling the creative juices flowing, this is something I can definitely always go back to and find something to kind of like help me get out of the rut. I also just really enjoyed the writing style. The one thing I didn't like about the writing style though was uh, I just felt like he quoted other people way too much. It felt like literally every page he was quoting someone and sometimes it'd be multiple times within a page. Um, but other than that, I really liked his writing style and like the way that he spoke to you, the reader. But yeah, I gave this four stars. So a fantastic nonfiction book that I read is A River in Darkness by Masaji Ishikawa. This was a lot shorter than I expected it to be, but it, do it does not matter how short it is. It packed a punch. I could not read this in one sitting. Um, so this is about one man's escape from North Korea. In this book, we follow Masaji Ishikawa and he is, he's half Korean, half Japanese. He was born in Japan. Okay, he was born in 1947 in Japan. And then in the 1960s, when he was 13 years old, his family then moved to North Korea um, under the propaganda of it being the promised land. He lived pretty much most of his life in North Korea. I don't think he escaped until he was in his 40s. In the 1990s, he escaped. He does talk a lot about his life living in North Korea and what it's like there. And it's, <laughs> whew, it's not a fun read. But what I also didn't expect, because you know, when you hear like, oh, someone escaped from North Korea, it's gonna end happy. It does not end happy. I cried. Um, even though he's escaped from North Korea, his life is still not great. It's it's still very much a challenge. Yeah, it's it's just oh, it was so crazy learning about the things that happened in North Korea. I really want to continue reading books that are like this though. I do find it fascinating, but like it's also very tragic and very horrible. But I want to hear about people's experiences. I think it's very good to learn about the things that these people have gone through, and so we can learn more about what North Korea is like. So that way, maybe one day. We can tear it down? I don't know if we'll be able to, is the problem. This is a great read. It was five stars. I highly recommend it. So then I read Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man by Emmanuel Acho. He was a football player for the Philadelphia Eagles. Very exciting. Now he's, I think, like a sports analyst on Fox, I think? He's somewhere being a sports analyst not stating the obvious reasons why I picked this up, like it's important to read these types of stories, so trying to read more of this type of stuff. So that's one of the obvious reasons why I picked it up. But the other reason is because Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man is a, I guess we can call it a TV series? I don't know, but it's on Instagram, at least that's where I watch it, where people will sit down with Emmanuel and just have uncomfortable conversations about race and about black people and all this stuff with a black man. The one that has been the most memorable for me was the one where he sat down with an entire like police department and talked with them about race. It was very uncomfortable but like definitely something that was needed uh, and I'm glad that he did it and I'm glad it, it happened. So. I highly recommend his show on Instagram, I guess. I guess it's on Instagram. Is it somewhere else or am I just being stupid? I I watch it through Instagram. But when I saw that it came out as a book form as well, I was very excited. I really enjoyed this. I think the format is really good, like the light, like the way he discusses it. But so each chapter obviously has like a theme with it. Um, so let's say we'll go with this chapter. It's the interracial family. He'll talk about it for a little bit and then he'll say let's rewind so we'll go into the past. We'll go into like the history of this topic, like how it began, all that stuff. And then let's get uncomfortable. Then we get to like the uncomfortable root of this topic and then it ends with talk it walk it which means ways that you can, um, words today are just failing me. Ways that you can use what you've learned in the real world and 
like things you can do to kind of help it and kind of help fix it, I guess. So I like the layout. I thought it was very well thought out. It's very well researched, very well written. The only issue I think I had with it is that it's a little, I don't want to, I feel like it might be a little too topical in a sense. Like I feel like people reading it now will get so much out of it, but if people are reading it 10 years from now, it might not be as topical in the sense where it's like he's listing things and talking about things that are literally happening right now and he has like a lot of like phone numbers and email email addresses in here and it's just like those might not be as relevant in 10 years from now as they are today um like i think he's even mentioned he even mentions like a court case that is currently going on right now and how we can help that but it's like i think 10 years from now whatever happens with that court case m might just be what happens and all the references, references, all the resources you gave us to like help out with that court case might not be like a thing anymore. So it's just one of those things where it's like, there's too many things mentioned in here that might not be as relevant 10 years from now. I hope I made sense. <laughs> Because obviously I'm not talking about the racism part of the book. I'm just talking about like the specific things that are happening in today's world that we will definitely benefit from, but it's just 10 years from now. We may not, they may not benefit it as much. You know what? I'm, I, I really hope I'm making sense. But yeah, but other than that, I really enjoyed it a lot. And I gave it four stars. But let's talk about the last nonfiction book that I read that is humor, um, and that's Weird Things Customers Say in Bookstores by Jen Campbell. I used to work in a bookstore. I heard people say random stuff. I still work in retail. I work at Starbucks now, and people still ask stupid questions. So stupid. Like, I don't understand why people ask so many stupid questions. But that's basically what this book is. She used to work in a bookstore, but then also this is like compiled of other people's experiences and she'll like list that person and be like, oh, this person heard someone say this. This is like a conversation, an actual conversation someone had with a customer. So I've just been talking about a lot of books and I wasn't even filming. So now I'm filming and now I gotta re-talk about all these books. <laughs> But I think I left off somewhere in the middle of this one. There's not much to say about this. Uh, it's just, I guess, what Neil Gaiman says on the front here. So funny, so sad. Uh, read it and sigh. And just question humanity. Like there was someone in here who legit asked where the sequel to Anne Frank's Diary was. Mm. I didn't rate this book. There's no need to rate it. Um, okay, so the next, we're gonna go on, we're gonna save the 2021 releases for last. So I'm gonna talk about I Am the Messenger by Marcus Zusak. I read Marcus Zusak's book, The Book Thief, years ago, loved it, it's still one of my favorite books of all time to this day. This book, not so much. This, I think, was his debut novel, his first one, and we follow Ed Kennedy, who is an underage cab driver. He finds himself in the middle of a bank heist and he ends up uh, being the hero, and so they put him in all the newspapers, and then that then leads to him getting these um, playing cards with like instructions on them for uh, people who he should help. And sometimes it's just like a little simple thing, like just buying ice cream for someone, but sometimes it's a, a really big thing, like helping this woman not be raped by her husband every night. So it's, there's a lot of things that he's doing, um, but there's also like the mystery around like who's sending these cards to him and why. And then of course he also has like his own separate life with his friends and the girl that he likes and just trying to figure that out, I guess, just like figure out his life and who he is and who he wants to be. It was fine. Most of the time it was very boring. I did like the end. I liked the reveal at the end. Uh, I thought it definitely like gave the book meaning. It gave it purpose. Um, it kind of had like a 
a, a, a lesson in there. So it was fine. Uh, I just, it's, it's not one I'll like ever go back to or really like think about. It was just like a time in the moment and then it's done and I'm like, okay. It was just okay. I don't really have a lot to say about this. Um, I gave it three stars. The next two books are also books I didn't really like. Uh, that's Leah on the Offbeat and Love Creekwood by Becky Albertalli. Uh, this is a book within the Simonverse and this is the novella for it. So Leah on the Offbeat. I heard a lot of, you know, bad reviews going into this book, which is why it took me so long to get to it, because I was gonna read it when it came out, but there were a lot of not great reviews, so I was hesitant. Uh, I am happy that I did finally read it. I don't think I hated this as much as everyone else seems to hate this book. I mean, it was great going back to the Simonverse and seeing Simon and his boyfriend again. If you haven't read the first book, I don't want to like reveal who his boyfriend is. I I'm scared that's going to be a spoiler for people, but I mean, they're not the main focus of this book. It's Leah and her love life. So Leah is Simon's best friend. Um, she is bisexual and we have her little romance that goes on. Um, which to me the romance just didn't make sense. Like I just, I can't see those two together. I can't see them being a thing. So, and I, I, I think maybe also too, like the writing of it, like the way that the, the romance happened just also didn't make sense to me. Leah's voice was very like cynical, very negative, <laughs> which was hard to read sometimes, but it didn't bug me too much. Overall, it was okay. Like I gave this one three stars as well, but I think it's a very generous three stars because I did enjoy my time reading this. It just, I had some issues with it. And then this one I gave it two stars, but I think it's like a generous two stars because I really didn't get anything out of this novella. So we just follow like our two main couples from the series and their first year of college. And it's all through emails. That was what really bugged me was that like, it's all through emails. So I felt like there was a lot that I was missing. Like you could tell in between emails that like maybe two months had gone by and there was like a lot of stuff that happened that we missed and are not being discussed. And I also just felt like I didn't really get anything out of this. Like this was just really not needed. Now we've got our 2021 releases and we're gonna start with the poetry because there's two poetries that came out in 2021. We have I Must Belong Somewhere by Dawn Lanuza and Shine Your Icy Crown by Amanda Loveless. I enjoyed both of these. Um, this one, uh, here's the thing. With poetry, it's hard for me to actually remember them. <laughs> um, I read this like literally within like the very beginning of January. I have an awful memory, but I remember liking it. I don't think I loved it. Like, I felt like this was fine, but I liked it enough where I want to keep it. I, I will say something I think I did like about this was that it wasn't the standard format that I see with poetry. Like, usually it's poetry's in parts, and then you've got like the first part, which is kind of like, oh, this is where everything fell apart. The second part is just like the struggle. You're really feeling it. The third part is like, you don't know how ever you're gonna dig yourself out of this hole and you're just doubting and low confidence. And then the fourth part, everything comes together. Everything's great again. Like it's just like the progression. But this didn't really have parts. It, it didn't have like that thing. It's just literally a collection of poems. And I liked them. I will also say both of these are modern poetry. I think that's what they're called. Um, so if you're not a fan of modern poetry, then you might not like these, but I really like modern poetry. This one, I mean, I love Amanda Loveless. This is her second book in her second series. No, her third series, but I didn't like her second series. Anyway, her poems are very much like fairy tale style. This one felt more so in that s style, I guess. But what I really, really liked about this was like the whole first part, the whole first half of this, um, collection. It, it has like on one side, it's what, you know, what you're saying, what your doubts and insecurities are. And then the second part is your big sister giving you advice on the said thing that you said. 
what are words? I don't know. It was nice. It was cute. It was great. And then the whole last half is, it's not in that format. It's not in that style of big sisterly advice based off of the little sister's insecurities. So I, I did enjoy both of these. I gave this one three stars and I gave this one four stars. So now on to the 2021 releases. I think you can see the very first book, so we're gonna talk about that one. It is Roman and Jewel by Dana L. Davis. This is a young adult contemporary following Jersey James. She is the understudy for this new Broadway show, which you kind of have to suspend your disbelief with a teenager, an actual teen, actual teenagers being in a Broadway show. Like I know we had Andrew Barth Feldman, an actual teenager being on Broadway, but that is the only case of that that I know happening. <laughs> so suspend your disbelief with a lot of things that happen in this book. We follow this, uh, uh, what is it? Okay, so this musical is kind of like if Lin-Manuel Miranda rewrote Romeo and Juliet. That's what the show basically is. And the show is called Roman and Jewel. Jersey James is the understudy to the lead, and the lead is played by Cinny, who is supposed to be like the teenage Beyonce of this world, and then the guy playing Roman is Zeppelin. <laughs> I suck at remembering names. And there's like this little, I don't want to say there's a love triangle, it's not really a love triangle, um, but there's like drama that happens love-wise and also not love-wise. There's a lot of drama that happens within the show and with the people in the cast, but you mainly do follow this like romance that's happening between Jersey and Zeppelin. Uh, and all the drama with that. Like, there's just a lot of drama in the show, in the show, in this book, that is also just, like, super unrealistic, but it is fun to read. The most unrealistic thing in this book, surprisingly, is how they described the YouTube videos. Because <laughs> they're, one of the, like, things that happen is, like, YouTube videos come out that kind of is not good PR for the show. That's all I'll say about that. And they were, the author mentioned in the book that like the video has been up for two hours at this point and the one video has two million views and it's like a Broadway video and it got two million views within two hours. That doesn't happen. That's not realistic. But then the other video, because there were two, the other video got 70 million views in two hours. I'm sorry, not even a BTS music video gets 70 million views in two hours. I, like, it was just like, next time please do research. Because <laughs> that is so unrealistic. It like made, it actually like physically made me mad. So it's a little, like little stuff like that I would say. It's like you gotta suspend your disbelief. Overall, it was a very fun read but it was just okay. I gave it three stars. Next I have The Dating Plan. I almost said The Dating Game. <laughs> the Dating Plan by Sarah Desai. This is an adult romance where we follow Daisy. <laughs> you see how I really don't remember people's names? So we follow Daisy who really doesn't want a relationship, at least like not right now, but her aunts keep like introducing her to these men, trying to like get her to get a boyfriend, but she keeps wanting, like, she just wants the ants off her back. And then we also have Liam, who is, like, this businessman. He, his grandfather died, and in the will, he gets the, like, wine distillery, or, like, the winery, um, as long as he is able to find a wife within, like, three months or something. And so they decide to fake date. This is, it's a fake dating, but it's also a second chance romance because they, they had crushes on each other back in high school and he was supposed to be her prom date, but then he never showed up and they never heard from him. And it's like 10 years later and she runs into him and she's like super mad at him, rightfully so. So they decide to do this fake dating and they're going to like fake get married and they'll just be married for a year and then they'll divorce and she can live her life alone by herself, which is what she wants. Um, and he gets the winery. But then, you know, of course, with these types of stories, it turns into a real romance. It was a fun time. I enjoyed it. But again, it was just kind of like, okay. So I gave it three stars. Okay, the next book I read was Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. I was so looking forward to this book. This is like the prequel to The Hate You Give. We are following Maverick. 
um, in the 90s when he's a teenager, and Maverick is Star's dad from The Hate You Give. This is like following his teenage years in where I think he's a senior in high school. Like it's his last year or maybe he's a junior in high school. Either way, he's about to become a dad. So this is like his story about from becoming a teenager to being a, a dad and being a father and also from being within a gang and trying to get out of the gang to in order to be a good father for his children. I absolutely love The Hate You Give. I love Angie Thomas's writing. So I just absolutely love Angie Thomas. I was so looking forward to this book and I did enjoy this book but I think I also just had like two high hopes, two high expectations that it could never meet. You know what I mean? I don't know. I think also too, it was just like one of those times in my life where I just wasn't in the mood for like hard hitting contemporary. Like I'm in the mood for sci-fi and like adventure. Like that's what my brain is craving these days. And so when you read something that's like not what your brain is craving, it doesn't live up to what you want it to be. I think that's what happened with me with this book because like this book was good. It was. I just, I don't think I liked it as much as I wanted to like it, as much as I was expecting to like, as much as I was expecting to love it. I liked the characters, I liked the dialogue, like there was a lot going for this book but I just don't think I was in the mood for this type of story. So I feel really bad giving this three stars but at the time that I read it, I don't know, maybe I'll need to reread this again when I'm more in the mood for this type of story, but like the time that I read it, I was kind of bored through most of it. It was weird, like I think the story was boring me, but her writing was what kept me going because I absolutely love Angie Thomas's writing. I'm so upset to have like a negative, not a negative review, but just like an okay review for that book. Ugh. Okay, there's two more books to talk about. I really enjoyed both of these books. I guess I'm saving the best for last. I didn't even mean to do that. But we have a complicated love story set in space uh, by Sean David Hutchinson. And that's exactly what this is. It's a complicated love story set in space. So this is definitely like a young adult sci-fi romance. And we follow Noah who wakes up in space. <laughs> like he's in a space suit and he's literally floating in space. And he's like floating right next to a spaceship and he's just like, how in the hell did I get here? What is going on? He eventually does make it into the spaceship and we meet DJ. We also meet Jenny and they're all in the same boat. Like they just woke up randomly on a spaceship. They have no idea how they got there. They have no idea where they are. And it's just trying to like figure out what's going on and why. But we get uh, a little love story between Noah and DJ. I think this was the longest book that I read in January, but I flew through this. It took me, oh my god, I want to say like three or four days to read it because I was just flying through this book. I was having so much fun with this book. I really, really enjoyed it a lot. The one thing that did bug me though was the main character. Like, I think Sean David Hutchinson just does this. This is my second Sean David Hutchinson book and I don't know how he's able to do this, but like he writes these characters that are so annoying like our main character we're in his head and he is just so annoying all the time but yet i still really like the character and i still really have a fun time reading even though the character annoys me it's so strange how sean david hutchison is able to do that where like i have these points of views of these guys who are just super annoying and i just want to like <laughs> Like, shut up, stop talking, stop thinking. Yet, I also really enjoy the character. And I have a fun time. I don't know how I was able to do that. But yeah, so I really enjoyed this one. I gave this four stars. And then this last one I wanna talk about was actually the last book that I read in the month. And I think it's also my favorite of the month. It's Unchosen by Katherine Blair. Mm -hmm. It's a young adult fantasy. I just, sorry, this cover is so Stunning. I am obsessed with this cover so much. This is a world where um, a disease slash curse has come across the land where when you look someone in the eyes who has this disease, you then get it. And it, it doesn't turn you into a zombie, but the way I describe them, it's going to sound like they're zombies, um, but it turns you like into this monster who likes to eat humans but they're not zombies because they're not 
dead. They just have this disease. You know what I mean? And like the longer you have it, like the more mean you get, <laughs> the more monster-like you become. But if you are able to give this disease to three other people within 24 hours, then you become immune and you don't become that monster. So you have the disease, but you just, you're not the monster. And you can't give it to other people once you've given it to three people. But with this book, we mainly follow three sisters. So we follow Charlotte. She's our only point of view, so we only get her point of view of the story. She does not have the disease. And she lives in this, like, society where, like, no one has it. And they're very, like, closed off from the rest of the world. And she has two other sisters. Her big sister, Harlow? <laughs> Harlow! Oh my god, yay! <laughs> Uh, her big sister Harlow, before the apocalypse, was like this punk rock badass chick. But during the apocalypse, the, during this time, she is now like the leader of an army. She's still badass. And then her other sister, Vanessa, before was like a gymnast and she was going to like become a big deal and hopefully get to the Olympics. And during the apocalypse, she is the chosen one. <laughs> <laughs> who is supposedly supposed to save the world from this curse. Charlotte, she, there's nothing special about her. She's like, my sisters are great and there's something special about them and then I'm just me sitting here being dead weight. She doesn't, she feels unchosen. All of a sudden, I think some people with the red eyes, the, they're the monsters, they find out the chosen one exists and they find out it's one of these three girls. So to protect her sister, Charlotte says that she's the chosen one. So then they kidnap her. She then gets sent on this like wild crazy adventure that then leads to, you know, trying to find a way to end this curse. And there's a romance that happens, which by the way, I have my new book boyfriend and his name is Seth Marsale. Like I fell in love. I also read this book within two days, <laughs> which never happens with a big, big book like this. I was just loving, loving, loving this book so much. I love the characters. I love the story. It was so fast paced. It was just an adventure and like things were just happening left and right. See like this is what I want. Like fantasy, adventure, sci- there's no sci-fi in here but like I want something that's action packed. This has it but it also had some romance with it. It was so good. I loved the writing. I loved the characters. The plot was great. Like Everything about this was just really great, and I gave it five stars. That is it. Those are the books that I read in January. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please come back for more. I will greatly appreciate it. And we'll see if I come out with videos next month. Who knows? Maybe I will read 20 books again in the month of February and have to do another wrap-up. Which it's looking like I might be. There's a lot of books I'm reading. <laughs> anyway, I will see you guys later with more videos. Bye!